Welcome to our video about counter current multiplication and urea recycling. I consider this video to be a continuation of the video about the physiology of the lopofelli. So please, before watching this video, please make sure that you watch the first video about the lopofelli. Now, after watching that, now you're ready. Now, let's get started. Before we start, give yourself a few minutes, read this question, and we're going to answer it at the end of the video. Regulating the urine osmolarity is the key in controlling the extracellular fluid osmolarity. So when the extracellular fluid osmolarity rises, the kidneys produce more concentrated urine and reabsorb or preserve more free water. On the other hand, when the extracellular fluid osmolarity falls or becomes more diluted, the kidney produces more diluted urine. So in other words, we are excreting or losing more free water. In order for this regulation to take place, we require two functioning arms or two functioning mechanisms. The first is the control of the corticomedullary osmotic gradient, and the second is the control of the antidiuretic hormone release. Before proceeding as a reminder, we have two types of nephrons. The first is called cortical nephrons, and this constitutes 85% of the entire nephrons of the kidney. These nephrons have the renal corpuscles located in the outer two-thirds of the cortex, so they are more far away from the medulla. The second type is called juxtamedullary, Juxta means near to or close to. These nephrons are located near the medulla because the renal corpuscles are located in the inner third of the cortex. These nephrons have their loop of Henle digging more deep into the medulla. And that's why these nephrons are responsible for generating the concentrated medulla. And the more we go deep into the medulla, the more concentrated the medulla goes or the more concentrated it becomes. And this is the responsibility mainly of the juxta medullary nephrons, even though they only constitute 15% of the entire number of nephrons in the kidney. There are two mechanisms that help to establish what's called corticopapillary osmotic gradient, or salty medulla. But first, what's the meaning of corticopapillary? There is a concentration difference in osmolarity between the outer cortex and all the way the inner medulla. The inner medulla means the medulla near the renal papilla, and that's why it's called corticopapillary. All the way up in the cortex, the osmolarity is much less. All the way down in the medulla, there is more and more and more osmolarity. So let's say it's 300 all the way up here, and it's 1200 all the way down here. There are two mechanisms that help to establish this corticopapillary osmotic gradient. The first is the urea recycling, which generates the urea gradient. And the second is the counter current multiplication, which generates the sodium gradient. These two mechanisms are important for the generation of concentrated urine. Without these two mechanisms, we'll be unable to concentrate the urine, so we're gonna be losing a lot of water in the urine, so we're gonna be more liable to dehydration. So the first mechanism is called counter current multiplication. Counter current means two currents going into two opposite directions. So let's say there is a current going in this way, there will be another current going into the opposite way. That's why it's called counter current. And that's because the flow of urine or the flow filtrate in the descending limb of the loop of Helly is going in this direction, and the flow filtrate on the other limb or on the ascending limb is going into the opposite direction. This counter current multiplication consists of two steps. The first step is called the single effect. And this is basically the movement of sodium, chloride, and potassium out of the thick ascending limb of the lopofelli. And this is responsible for the generation of hyperosmolar interstitium, and that will in turn attract water. The second step in this multiplication process is what's called countercurrent flow. This is basically the flow of filtrate from the descending limb that will push the flow back into the ascending limb. And then, in the ascending thick limb, the sodium, potassium, and chloride will move out. So this is basically what's happening in this countercurrent multiplication. The filtrate goes into this direction, pushes more filtrate into this direction, and then through active transport, sodium, potassium, and chloride are going out into the interstitium, creating hyperosmolar interstitium that will in turn attract water reabsorption. So again, countercurrent multiplication is the process of using energy to generate an osmotic gradient that's necessary to reabsorb water and generate a concentrated urine. 
because remember the movement of solids from the thick ascending lip of the loop of heli into the interstitium is an active process that requires the generation of energy. Without this medullary osmotic gradient, the body will be unable to keep water, and that will lead to the loss of large amounts of urine and to dehydration. Juxta medullary nephrons are the ones responsible mainly for generating a concentrated medulla, because remember we said the juxta medullary nephrons are the ones that digs more deep into the medulla, and that's why they are more responsible for generating the concentrated medulla. The loop of heli specifically is the major segment that's responsible for the process of generation of countercurrent multiplication. And finally, please don't confuse countercurrent multiplication with countercurrent exchange. Countercurrent exchange is a totally different process and totally different mechanism. We're going to discuss that later in the video. But for now, please don't confuse the countercurrent multiplication and countercurrent exchange. So this is a simplified illustration of the process of countercurrent multiplication. This process starts with the movement of the filtrate from the proximal convoluted tubule into the thin descending limb of the loop of heli. The osmolarity of the tubular fluid at this stage is almost equal to the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid, so let's say it's 300. And as we move down the thin descending limb of the loop of heli, the osmolarity of the tubular fluid increases progressively. Because remember, the thin descending limb of the loop of heli is only permeable to water and urea. So the water will move out from low concentration into high concentration to equalize the osmolarity. So more water will move out. And the urea will move along its concentration gradient from the interstitium into the tubular fluid. But don't worry about the urea for now. As we move down the thin descending limb of the loop of heli, the osmolarity of the tubular fluid is equalizing with the osmolarity of the tubular interstitium. So let's say at this stage we've reached 600. And then if we keep going down until we reach this point, which is all the way the lowest point in the thin descending limb of the loop of heli, we're going to reach the highest osmolarity of the tubular filtrate because it's equalizing with the super hyper osmolar medullary interstitium near the renal papilla. Remember we said near the renal papilla, the medullary interstitium is the highest concentrated. So we're going to reach like, let's say, 1200 in this stage. And then as we move up again into the thin ascending limb of the loop of heli, this part is impermeable to water. It's only permeable to solutes. So solutes like sodium and chloride will move out. So the osmolarity of the tubular filtrate will go down again. So it will become more dilute again. And it will equal with that of the osmolarity of the medullary interstitium. So it will go back, let's say here, into 600. As we move up into the thick ascending limb of the loop of heli, the osmolarity of the tubular fluid is equal to that of the osmolarity of the medullary interstitium. So any further movement of solutes from the tubular fluid into the interstitium requires active transport. And that's why cells of the thick ascending limb of the loop of heli are cuboidal cells. They contain the NK ATPase that pumps sodium into the outside in exchange of potassium. And on the apical side, we have the NKCC2, which is responsible for the reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride through secondary active transport into the intracellular space and then from there into the medullary interstitium. And this part of the nephron is what's responsible for the creation of the high osmolarity of the medullary interstitium. The active transport of solutes from the thick ascending limb into the medullary interstitium is what creates the hyperosmolar medullary interstitium. On the other hand, it will dilute the tubular filtrate. The tubular filtrate, by the time it exits the loop of heli, it becomes very, very diluted. Let's say at a 200 at this stage. So let's redraw this again. By the time the tubular fluid reaches the loop of heli, its osmolarity is equal to that of the extracellular fluid osmolarity. So let's say at a level of 300. As we keep going down the thin descending limb of the loop of heli, the osmolarity of the tubular fluid progressively increases. 
because this part of the lobophily is permeable to water, water moves out, the osmolarity progressively increases as it equalizes with the osmolarity of the medial interstitium. So let's say we go from 300 into 600 into 900 and to all the way at the level of the bottom of the loop of Henley into 1200 because this is the highest point of osmolarity in the medullary interstitium near the renal papilla. So this is the highest level of osmolarity the tubular fluid reaches. And then as we go up again into the thin ascending limb of the loop of Henley, the osmolarity starts to progressively decrease because this segment is no longer permeable to water. It's only permeable to solutes. So solutes like sodium and chloride moves out of the tubular fluid into the medullary interstitium. So we keep progressively reducing the osmolarity from let's say 1200 into 1000 into 600 until we reach the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle actively pumps solutes into the medullary interstitium. And that's what creates the hyperosmolar medullary interstitium. At the same time, this decreases even more the osmolarity of the tubular filtrate, which goes from, let's say, 600 into 300, and finally, by the time it exits the loop of Henle, it reaches the very low concentration or the very low osmolarity of, let's say, 200. What we just discussed was the first step in the countercurrent multiplication, which is the single effect. The second step is the countercurrent flow. This is basically the continuous flow of filtrate into the loop of Henle that will push down the filtrate that's already in the loop of Henle further down and then further up. And this will make sure that the single effect is keep happening. If this process is keep continuing the same way, this will result in the creation or the generation of hyperosmolar medullary interstitium, especially at the level of the renal papilla all the way down at the medullary interstitium. Another point to remember is that the level or the degree of osmolarity of the medullary interstitium is dependent on the patient's hydration status. If somebody is too dehydrated, the medullary interstitium will be too concentrated. This will allow more movement of water from the collecting ducts through the action of antidiuretic hormone, which increases the number of aquaporin channels in the collecting duct. This will allow more movement of water into the medullary interstitium, which is now more concentrated. On the other hand, if somebody is too hydrated or there is a dilution of the extracellular fluid or there is more excess water in the body, the medullary interstitium will be less concentrated because this will allow less movement of water from the tubular lumen into the interstitium. So this will allow more excretion of water into the urine. The second mechanism in the creation of the corticopapillary osmotic gradient is what's called urea recycling. We have to always remember that urea is freely filtered. 40% of this filtered urea goes into the urine, and that helps to create a hyperosmolar urine. Along the nephron, urea moves from areas of high concentration into areas of low concentration along its concentration gradient without the need for active transport. 50% of the filtered urea is reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. The filtrate inside the proximal convoluted tubule is more concentrated compared to the outside. And this explains why urea moves from the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule to the outside. Because it's more concentrated inside and it's less concentrated outside here in the outer medulla. And this will decrease the concentration of urea inside the tubular fluid that goes into the lobe of Henle. And this will explain the remaining process of urea recycling as we're going to discuss in a minute. Next is along the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle, urea gets secreted back into the lumen. And this is because if you remember we said 50% of the filtered urea becomes reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. And this will make the urea concentration of the tubular filtrate that goes into the loop of Henle more diluted. So there is more urea in the outside in the tubular interstitium than the inside of the tubular lumen. So the urea will move into the tubular lumen from the tubular interstitium. And it's actually going to get even more concentrated than its original concentration in the tubular filtrate. 
it's going to go up to 110%. You have to keep remembering that thin and thick ascending lamps of the Lopofelli are totally impermeable to urea. Next in the collecting ducts, the antidiuretic hormone will work by increasing the reabsorption of water and urea. And this is through the increasing expression of aquaporin channels for water reabsorption and urea transporters for urea reabsorption. And basically 70% of the urea is reabsorbed in this segment. Also, the movement of water out of the tubular lumen into the interstitium makes the urea concentration inside the tubular lumen even more concentrated. And this will drive even more movement of urea from inside the tubular lumen to the outside. Some of this reabsorbed urea will be secreted back into the thin descending lamp of the Lopofelli. And this constitutes the urea recycling or the urea loop. The rest of the urea that's not going to be reabsorbed back into the thin descending lamp of the Lopofelli will contribute to the formation of the hypertonic medullary interstitia. So if we started with a concentration of 110% of urea inside the tubular fluid at the lower part of the thin descending lamp of the Lopofelli, almost 70% of that amount of urea will be reabsorbed and 40% will go into the urine. Remember we said countercurrent multiplication does not equal countercurrent exchange. Countercurrent exchange is a completely different process. This process helps to preserve the inner medullary high osmolarity. And this is by preventing the washout of salt. The peritubular capillaries surrounding the thin descending lamp of the loop of heli are hypoosmolar compared to the medullary interstitium. So they have less concentration of sodium chloride and higher concentration of water. So the sodium chloride will move from areas of high concentration into areas of low concentration into the peritubular capillaries. And the water will move from the peritubular capillaries into the medullary interstitium. If this process keeps going, we're gonna lose the high osmolarity of the medullary interstitium. But that doesn't take place because we are going now into now, in the peritubular capillaries surrounding the ascending lamp of the loop of Helly, the plasma becomes hyperosmolar. It contains higher concentration of sodium chloride and lower concentration of water. So the sodium chloride will move back into the medullary interstitium, and the water will move back from the medullary interstitium into the peritubular capillaries. And this constitutes the process of countercurrent exchange. As we said, this will help to prevent the washout of salt and will preserve the high osmolarity of the medullary interstitium. Now let's go back to this very first slide. So if the extracellular fluid osmolarity rises, that means the person is dehydrated, and that means we need to preserve more water. In that case, the corticomedullary osmotic gradient will rise. So now we have more concentrated medulla or more salty medulla. At the same time, the antidiuretic hormone release will increase. So this will make sure we have more aquaporin channels for water reabsorption. In this case, we are excreting a concentrated urine. On the opposite side, if the extracellular fluid osmolarity falls, that means the body has a lot of water and that means we need to lose a lot of water. In that case, the corticomedullary osmotic gradient will go down, and the antidiuretic hormone release will also go down, and that makes sure we are excreting more water in the urine. Finally, are you able to answer this question now? Give yourself a few minutes to answer this question. E is going to be the correct answer. This is the end of this video. I hope I was able to simplify the topic. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.